section three of beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand religions of india part one brahmanism and buddhism that form of ancient religion which has of late excited the most interest is buddhism an inquiry into its characteristics is especially interesting since so large a part of the human race nearly five hundred millions out of the thirteen hundred millions still profess to embrace the doctrines which were taught by buddha although his religion has become so corrupted that his original teachings are nearly lost sight of the same may be said of the doctrines of confucius the religions of ancient egypt assyria and greece have utterly passed away and what we have had to say of these is chiefly a matter of historic interest as revealing the forms assumed by the human search for a supernatural ruler when moulded by human ambitions powers and indulgence in the lust of the eye and the pride of life rather than by aspirations toward the pure and spiritual buddha was the great reformer of the religious system of the hindus although he lived nearly fifteen hundred or two thousand years after the earliest brahmanical ascendancy but before we can appreciate his work and mission we must examine the system he attempted to reform even as it is impossible to present the protestant reformation without first considering medieval catholicism before the time of luther it was the object of buddha to break the yoke of the brahmins and to release his countrymen from the austerities the sacrifices and the rigid sacerdotalism which these ancient priests imposed without essentially subverting ancient religious ideas he was a moralist and reformer rather than the founder of a religion brahmanism is one of the oldest religions of the world it was flourishing in india at a period before history was written it was coeval with the religion of egypt in the time of abraham and perhaps at a still earlier date but of its earliest form and extent we know nothing except from the sacred poems of the hindus called the vedas written in sanskrit probably fifteen hundred years before christ for even the date of the earliest vedas is unknown fifty years ago we could not have understood the ancient religions of india but sir william jones in the latter part of the last century a man of immense erudition and genius for the acquisition of languages at that time an english judge in india prepared the way for the study of sanskrit the literary language of ancient india by the translation and publication of the laws of menu he was followed in his labors by the schlegels of germany and by numerous scholars and missionaries within fifty years this ancient and beautiful language has been so perseveringly studied that we know something of the people by whom it was once spoken even as egyptologists have revealed something of ancient egypt by interpreting the hieroglyphics and chaldean investigators have found stores of knowledge in the babylonian bricks the sanskrit as now interpreted reveals to us the meaning of those poems called vedas by which we are enabled to understand the early laws and religion of the hindus it is poetry not history which makes this revelation for the hindus have no history farther back than five or six hundred years before christ it is from homer and hesiod that we get an idea of the gods of greece not from herodotus or xenophon from comparative philology a new science of which professor max muller is one of the greatest expounders we learn that the roots of various european languages as well as of the latin and greek are substantially the same as those of the sanskrit spoken by the hindus thirty five hundred years ago from which it is inferred that the hindus were a people of like remote origin with the greeks the italic races romans italians french the slavic races russian polish bohemian the teutonic races of england and the continent and the celtic races these are hence alike called the indo-european races and as the same linguistic roots are found in their languages and in the zendavesta we infer that the ancient persians or inhabitants of iran belong to the same great aryan race the original seat of this race it is supposed was in the high tablelands of central asia in or near bactria east of the caspian sea and north and west of the himalaya mountains this country was so cold and sterile and unpropitious that winter predominated and it was difficult to support life but the people inured to hardship and privation were bold hardy adventurous and enterprising it is a most interesting process as described by the philologists which has enabled them by tracing the history of words through their various modifications in different living languages to see how the lines of growth converge as they are followed back to the simple aryan roots and there 
getting at the meanings of the things or thoughts the words originally expressed we see revealed in the reconstruction of a language that no longer exists the material objects and habits of thought and life of a people who passed away before history began so imperishable are the unconscious embodiments of mind even in the airy and unsubstantial forms of unwritten speech by this process then we learn that the aryans were a nomadic people and had made some advance in civilization they lived in houses which were roofed which had windows and doors their common cereal was barley the grain of cold climates their wealth was in cattle and they had domesticated the cow the sheep the goat the horse and the dog they used yokes axes and plows they wrought in various metals they spun and wove navigated rivers and sailboats and fought with bows lances and swords they had clear perceptions of the rights of property which were based on land their morals were simple and pure and they had strong natural affections polygamy was unknown among them they had no established sacerdotal priesthood they worshipped the powers of nature especially fire the source of light and heat which they so much needed in their dreary land authorities differ as to their primeval religion some supposing that it was monotheistic and others polytheistic and others again pantheistic most of the ancient nations were controlled more or less by priests who as their power increased instituted a caste to perpetuate their influence whether or not we hold the primitive religion of mankind to have been a pure theism directly revealed by god which is my own conviction it is equally clear that the former religion recorded in the earliest written records of poetry or legend was a worship of the sun and moon and planets i believe this to have been a corruption of original theism many think it to have been a stage of upward growth in the religious sense of primitive man in all the ancient nations the sun god was a prominent deity as the giver of the heat and light and hence of fertility to the earth the emblem of the sun was fire and hence fire was deified especially among the hindus under the name of agni the latin ignis fire caloric or heat in some form was among the ancient nations supposed to be the animus mundi in egypt as we have seen osiris the principal deity was a form of ra the sun god in assyria asher the substitute for ra was the supreme deity in india we find mitra and in persia mithra the sun god among the prominent deities as helios was among the greeks and phoebus apollo among the romans the sun was not always the supreme deity but invariably held one of the highest places in the pagan pantheon it is probable that the religion of the common progenitors of the hindus persians greeks romans celts teutons and slavs in their hard and sterile home in central asia was a worship of the powers of nature verging toward pantheism although the earliest of the vedas representing the ancient faith seem to recognize a supreme power and intelligence god as the common father of the race to whom prayers and sacrifices were devoutly offered freeman clark quotes from muller's ancient sanskrit literature one of the hymns in which the unity of god is most distinctly recognized in the beginning there arose the source of golden light he was the only lord of all that is he established the earth and sky who is the god to whom we shall offer our sacrifices it is he who giveth life who giveth strength who governeth all men through whom heaven was established and the earth created but if the supreme god whom we adore was recognized by this ancient people he was soon lost sight of in the multiplied manifestations of his power so that ralston thinks that when the aryan race separated in their various migrations which resulted in what we call the indo-european group of races there was no conception of a single supreme power from whom man and nature alike have their origin but nature worship ending in an extensive polytheism as among the assyrians and egyptians as to these aryan migrations we do not know when a large body crossed the himalaya mountains and settled on the banks of the indus but it was probably at least two thousand years before christ northern india had great attractions to those hardy nomadic people who found it so difficult to get a living during the long winters of their primeval home india was a country of fruits and flowers with an inexhaustible soil favorable to all kinds of production where but little manual labor was required a country abounding in every kind of animals and every kind of birds 
a land of precious stones and minerals of hills and valleys of majestic rivers and mountains with a beautiful climate and a sunny sky these aryan conquerors drove before them the aboriginal inhabitants who were chiefly mongolians or reduced them to a degrading vassalage the conquering race was white the conquered was dark though not black and this difference of color was one of the original causes of indian caste it was some time after the settlement of the aryans on the banks of the indus and the ganges before the vedas were composed by the poets who as usual gave form to religious belief as they did in persia and greece these poems or hymns are pantheistic there is no recognition says monier williams of a supreme god disconnected with the worship of nature there was a vague and indefinite worship of the infinite under various names such as the sun the sky the air the dawn the winds the storms the waters the rivers which alike charmed and terrified and seemed to be instinct with life and power god was in all things and all things in god but there was no idea of providential agency or of personality in the vedic hymns the number of gods is not numerous only thirty-three the chief of these were varuna the sky mitra the sun and indra the storm after these agni fire and soma the moon the worship of these divinities was originally simple consisting of prayer praise and offerings there were no temples and no imposing sacerdotalism although the priests were numerous the prayers and praises described the wisdom power and goodness of the deity addressed and when the customary offerings had been made the worshipper prayed for food life health posterity wealth protection happiness whatever the object was generally for outward prosperity rather than for improvement in character or for forgiveness of sin peace of mind or power to resist temptation the offerings to the gods were propitiatory in the form of victims or libations of some juice nor did these early hindus take much thought of a future life there is nothing in the rig veda of a belief in the transmigration of the souls although the vedic bards seem to have had some hope of immortality he who gives alms says one poet goes to the highest place in heaven he goes to the gods where there is eternal life in the world where the sun is placed in that immortal imperishable world place me o soma where there is happiness and delight where joy and pleasures reside where the desires of our heart are attained there make me immortal in the oldest vedic poems there were great simplicity and joyousness without allusion to those rites ceremonies and sacrifices which formed so prominent a part of the religion of india at a later period four hundred years after the rig veda was composed we come to the brahmanic age when the laws of menu were written when the aryans were living in the valley of the ganges and the caste system had become national the supreme deity is no longer one of the powers of nature like mitra or indra but according to menu he is brahm or brahma an eternal unchangeable absolute being the soul of all beings who having willed to produce various beings from his own divine substance created the waters and placed them in a productive seed the seed became an egg and in that egg he was born but sat inactive for a year when he caused the egg to divide itself and from its two divisions he framed the heaven above and the earth beneath from the supreme soul brahma drew forth mind existing substantially though unperceived by the senses and before mind the reasoning power he produced consciousness the internal monitor and before them he produced the great principle of the soul the soul is in its substance from brahma himself and is destined finally to be resolved into him the soul then is simply an emanation from brahma but it will not return unto him at death necessarily but must migrate from body to body until it is purified by profound abstraction and emancipated from all desires this is the substance of the hindu pantheism as taught by the laws of menu it accepts god but without personality or interference with the world's affairs not a god to be loved scarcely to be feared but a mere abstraction of the mind the theology which is thus taught in the brahmanic vedas it would seem is the result of lofty questionings and profound meditation on the part of the indian sages or priests rather than the creation of poets in the laws of menu intended to exalt the brahmanical caste we read as translated by sir william jones to a man contaminated by sensuality neither the vedas nor liberality nor sacrifices nor strict observances nor pious austerities ever procure felicity let not a man be proud of his rigorous devotion let him not having sacrificed utter a falsehood having made a donation let him never proclaim it by falsehood the sacrifice becomes vain by pride the merit of devotion is lost 
single is each man born single he dies single he receives the reward of the good and single the punishment of his evil deeds by forgiveness of injuries the learned are purified by liberality those who have neglected their duty by pious meditation those who have secret thoughts by devout austerity those who best know the vedas bodies are cleansed by water the mind is purified by truth the vital spirit by theology and devotion the understanding by clear knowledge a faithful wife who wishes to attain in heaven the mansion of her husband must do nothing unkind to him be he living or dead let her not when her lord is deceased even pronounce the name of another man let her continue till death forgiving all injuries performing harsh duties avoiding every sensible pleasure and carefully practicing the incomparable rules of virtue the soul itself is its own witness the soul itself is its own refuge offend not the conscious soul the supreme eternal witness of man o friend to virtue the supreme spirit which is the same as thyself resides in thy bosom perpetually and is an all-knowing inspector of thy goodness or wickedness such were the truths uttered on the bank of the ganges one thousand years before christ but with these views there is an exaltation of the brahmanical or sacerdotal life hard to be distinguished from the recognition of divine qualities from his high birth says manu a brahman is an object of veneration even to deities hence great things are expected of him his food must be roots and fruit his clothing of bark fibers he must spend his time in reading the vedas he is to practice austerities by exposing himself to heat and cold he is to beg food but once a day he must be careful not to destroy the life of the smallest insect he must not taste intoxicating liquors a brahman who has thus mortified his body by these modes is exalted into the divine essence this was the early creed of the brahman before corruption set in and in these things we see a striking resemblance to the doctrines of buddha had there been no corruption of brahmanism there would have been no buddhism for the principles of buddhism were those of early brahmanism but brahmanism became corrupted like the mosaic law under the sedulous care of the sacerdotal orders it ripened into a most burdensome ritualism the brahmanical caste became tyrannical exacting and oppressive with the supposed sacredness of his person and with the laws made in his favor the brahmin became intolerable to the people who were ground down by sacrifices expiatory offerings and wearisome and minute ceremonies of worship caste destroyed all ideas of human brotherhood it robbed the soul of its affections and aspirations like the pharisees in the time of jesus the brahmins became oppressors of the people as in pagan egypt and in christian medieval europe the priests saw the keys of heaven and hell their power was more than druidical but the brahmin when true to the laws of menu led in one sense a lofty life nor can we despise a religion which recognized the value and immortality of the soul a state of future rewards and punishments though its worship was encumbered by rites ceremonies and sacrifices it was spiritual in its essential peculiarities having reference to another world rather than to this which is more than we can say of the religion of the greeks it was not worldly in its ends seeking to save the soul rather than to pamper the body it had aspirations after a higher life it was profoundly reverential recognizing a supreme intelligence and power indefinitely indeed but sincerely not an incarnated deity like the zeus of the greeks but an infinite spirit pervading the universe the pantheism of the brahmins was better than the godless materialism of the chinese it aspired to rise to a knowledge of god as the supremest wisdom and grandest attainment of mortal man it made too much of sacrifices but sacrifices were common to all the ancient religions except the persian he who through knowledge or religious acts henceforth attains to immortality shall first present his body death to thee whether human sacrifices were offered in india when the vedas were composed we do not know but it is believed to be probable the oldest form of sacrifice was the offering of food to the deity dr h c trumbull in his work on the blood covenant thinks that the origin of animal sacrifices was like that of circumcision a pouring out of blood the universal ancient symbol of life as a sign of devotion to the deity and the substitution of animals was a natural and necessary mode of making this act of consecration a frequent and continuing one this presents a nobler view of the whole sacrificial system than the common one 
yet doubtless the latter soon prevailed for falling upon the devoted life offerings to the divine friend came propitiatory rites to appease divine anger or gain divine favor then came in the natural human self-seeking of the sacerdotal class for the multiplication of sacrifices tended to exalt the priesthood and thus to perpetuate caste again the brahmans if practising austerities to weaken sensual desires like the monks of syria and upper egypt were meditative and intellectual they evolved out of their brains whatever was lofty in their system of religion and philosophy constant and profound meditation on the soul on god and on immortality was not without its natural results they explored the world of metaphysical speculation there is scarcely an hypothesis advanced by philosophers in ancient or modern times which may not be found in brahmanical writings we find in the writings of these hindus materialism atomism pantheism pyrrhonism idealism they anticipated plato kant and hegel they could boast of their spinozas and their humes long before alexander dreamed of crossing the indus from them the pythagoreans borrowed a great part of their mystical philosophy of their doctrine of the transmigration of souls and the unlawfulness of eating animal food from them aristotle learned the syllogism in india the human mind exhausted itself in attempting to detect the laws which regulate its operation before the philosophers of greece were beginning to enter the precincts of metaphysical inquiry this intellectual subtlety acumen and logical power the brahmins never lost Today, the Christian missionary finds them his superiors in the sports of logical tournaments, whenever the Brahmin condescends to put forth his powers of reasoning. Brahmanism carried idealism to the extent of denying any reality to sense or matter, declaring that sense is a delusion. It sought to leave the soul emancipated from desire, from a material body, in a state which according to Indian metaphysics is being, but not existence. Desire, anger, ignorance evil thoughts are consumed by the fire of knowledge but i will not attempt to explain the ideal pantheism which brahmanical philosophers substituted for the nature worship taught in the earlier vedas this proved too abstract for the people and the brahmins in the true spirit of modern jesuitism wishing to accommodate their religion to the people who were in bondage to their tyranny and who have ever been inclined to sensuous worship multiplied their sacrifices and sacerdotal rites and even permitted a complicated polytheism gradually piety was divorced from reality siva and vishnu became worshipped as well as brahma and a host of other gods unknown to the earlier vedas in the sixth century before christ the corruption of society had become so flagrant under the teachings and government of the brahmins that a reform was imperatively needed the pride of race had put an impassable barrier between the aryan hindus and the conquered aborigines while the pride of both had built up an equally impassable barrier between the different classes among the aryan people themselves the old childlike joy in life so manifest in the vedas had died away a funereal gloom hung over the land and the gloomiest people of all were the brahmins themselves devoted to a complicated ritual of ceremonial observances to needless and cruel sacrifices and a repulsive theology the worship of nature had degenerated into the worship of impure divinities the priests were inflated with a puerile but sincere belief in their own divinity and inculcated a sense of duty which was nothing else than a degrading slavery to their own caste end of section three section four of beacon lights of history volume one the old pagan civilizations this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Beacon Lights of History, Volume 1 The Old Pagan Civilizations by John Lord. Religions of India, Part 2. Under these circumstances, Buddhism arose as a protest against Brahmanism. But it was rather an ethical than a religious movement it was an attempt to remove misery from the world and to elevate ordinary life by a reform of morals it was effected by a prince who goes by the name of buddha the enlightened who was supposed by his later followers to be an incarnation of deity miraculously conceived and sent into the world to save men he was nearly contemporary with confucius although the buddhistic doctrines were not introduced into china until about two hundred years before the christian era he is supposed to have belonged to a warlike tribe called Sakyas, of great reputed virtue, 
engaged in agricultural pursuits who had entered northern india and made a permanent settlement several hundred years before the name by which the reformer is generally known is guatama borrowed by the sakyas after their settlement in india from one of the ancient vedic bard families the fountain of our knowledge of sakya buddha is from a life of him by asvagosha in the first century of our era and this life is again founded on a legendary history not framed after any indian model but worked out among the nations in the north of india the life of buddha by asvagosha is a poetical romance of nearly ten thousand lines it relates the miraculous conception of the indian sage by the descent of a spirit on his mother maya a woman of great purity of mind the child was called siddhartha or the perfection of all things his father ruled a considerable territory and was careful to conceal from the boy as he grew up all knowledge of the wickedness and misery of the world he was therefore carefully educated within the walls of the palace and surrounded with every luxury but not allowed even to walk or drive in the royal gardens for fear he might see misery and sorrow a beautiful girl was given to him in marriage full of dignity and grace with whom he lived in supreme happiness at length as his mind developed and his curiosity increased to see and know things and people beyond the narrow circle to which he was confined he obtained permission to see the gardens which surrounded the palace his father took care to remove anything in his way which could suggest misery or sorrow but a diva or angel assumed the form of an aged man and stood beside his path apparently struggling for life weak and oppressed this was a new sight to the prince who inquired of his charioteer what kind of man it was forced to reply the charioteer told him that this infirm old man had once been young sportive beautiful and full of every enjoyment on hearing this the prince sank into profound meditation and returned to the palace sad and reflective for he had learned that the common lot of man is sad that no matter how beautiful strong and sportive a boy is the time will come in the course of nature when this boy will be wrinkled infirm and helpless he became so miserable and dejected on this discovery that his father to divert his mind arranged other excursions for him but on each occasion a diva contrived to appear before him in the form of some disease or misery at last he saw a dead man carried to his grave which still more deeply agitated him for he had not known that this calamity was the common lot of all men the same painful impression was made on him by the death of animals and by the hard labors and privations of poor people the more he saw of life as it was the more he was overcome by the sight of sorrow and hardship on every side he became aware that youth vigor and strength of life in the end fulfilled the law of ultimate destruction while meditating on this sad reality beneath a flowering jambu tree where he was seated in the profoundest contemplation a diva transformed into a religious ascetic came to him and said i am a shaman depressed and sad at the thought of age disease and death i have left my home to seek some way of rescue yet everywhere i find these evils all things hasten to decay therefore i seek that happiness which is only to be found in that which never perishes that never knew a beginning that looks with equal mind on enemy and friend that heeds not wealth nor beauty the happiness to be found in solitude in some dell free from molestation all thought about the world destroyed this embodies the soul of buddhism its elemental principle to escape from a world of misery and death to hide oneself in contemplation in some lonely spot where indifference to passing events is gradually acquired where life becomes one grand negation and where the thoughts are fixed on what is eternal and imperishable instead of on the mortal and transient the prince who was now about thirty years of age after this interview with the supposed ascetic firmly resolved himself to become a hermit and thus attain to a higher life and rise above the misery which he saw around him on every hand so he clandestinely and secretly escapes from his guarded palace lays aside his princely habits and ornaments dismisses all attendants and even his horse seeks the companionship of brahmins and learns all their penances and tortures finding a patient trial of this of no avail for his purpose he leaves the brahmins and repairs to a quiet spot by the banks of a river and for six years practices the most severe fasting and profound meditation this was the form which piety had assumed in india from time immemorial under the guidance of the brahmins for siddhartha as yet is not the enlightened he is only an inquirer after that saving knowledge which will open the door of a divine felicity 
and raise him above a world of disease and death siddhartha's rigorous austerities however do not open this door of saving truth his body is wasted and his strength fails he is near unto death the conviction fastens on his lofty and inquiring mind that to arrive at the end he seeks he must enter by some other door than that of painful and useless austerities and hence that the teachings of the brahmins are fundamentally wrong he discovers that no amount of austerities will extinguish desire or produce ecstatic contemplation in consequence of these reflections a great change comes over him which is the turning point of his history he resolves to quit his self-inflicted torments as of no avail he meets a shepherd's daughter who offers him food out of compassion for his emaciated and miserable condition the rich rice milk sweet and perfumed restores his strength he renounces asceticism and wanders to a spot more congenial to his changed views and condition siddhartha's full enlightenment however has not yet come under the shade of the bodhi tree he devotes himself again to religious contemplation and falls into rapt ecstasies he remains a while in peaceful quiet the morning sunbeams the dispersing mists and lovely flowers seem to pay tribute to him he passes through successive stages of ecstasy and suddenly upon his opened mind bursts the knowledge of his previous births in different forms of the causes of rebirth ignorance the root of evil and unsatisfied desires and of the way to extinguish desires by right thinking speaking and living not by outward observance of forms and ceremonies he is emancipated from the thraldom of those austerities which have formed the basis of religious life for generations unknown and he resolves to teach buddha travels slowly to the sacred city of benares converting by the way even brahmins themselves he claims to have reached perfect wisdom he is followed by disciples for there was something attractive and extraordinary about him his person was beautiful and commanding while he shows that painful austerities will not produce wisdom he also teaches that wisdom is not reached by self-indulgence that there is a middle path between penance and pleasures even temperance the use but not abuse of the good things of earth in his first sermon he declares that sorrow is in self therefore to get rid of sorrow is to get rid of self the means to this end is to forget self in deeds of mercy and kindness to others to crucify demoralizing desires to live in the realm of devout contemplation the active life of buddha now begins and for fifty years he travels from place to place as a teacher gathers around him disciples frames rules for his society and brings within his community both the rich and the poor he even allows women to enter it he thus matures his system which is destined to be embraced by so large a part of the human race and finally dies at the age of eighty surrounded by reverential followers who see in him an incarnation of the deity thus buddha devoted his life to the welfare of men moved by an exceeding tenderness and pity for the objects of misery which he beheld on every side he attempted to point out a higher life by which sorrow would be forgotten he could not prevent sorrow culminating in old age disease and death but he hoped to make men ignore their miseries and thus rise above them to a beatific state of devout contemplation and the practice of virtues for which he laid down certain rules and regulations it is astonishing how the new doctrines spread from india to china from china to japan and ceylon until eastern asia was filled with pagodas temples and monasteries to attest his influence some eighty five thousand existed in china alone buddha probably had as many converts in china as confucius himself the buddhists from time to time were subjected to great persecution from the emperors of china in which their sacred books were destroyed and in india the brahmins at last regained their power and expelled buddhism from the country in the year 845 a.d two hundred and sixty thousand monks and nuns were made to return to secular life in china being regarded as mere drones lazy useless members of the community but the policy of persecution was reversed by succeeding emperors in the thirteenth century there were in china nearly fifty thousand buddhist temples and two hundred and thirteen thousand monks and these represented but a fraction of the professed adherents of the religion under the present dynasty the buddhists are proscribed but still they flourish now what has given to the religion of buddha such an extraordinary attraction for the people of eastern asia buddhism has a twofold aspect practical and speculative in its most definite form it was a moral and philanthropic movement 
the reaction against brahmanism which had no humanity and which was as repulsive and oppressive as roman catholicism was when loaded down with ritualism and sacerdotal rites when europe was governed by priests when churches were damp gloomy crypts before the tall cathedrals arose in their artistic beauty from a religious and philosophical point of view buddhism at first did not materially differ from brahmanism the same dreamy pietism the same belief in the transmigration of souls the same pantheistic ideas of god and nature the same desire for rest and final absorption in the divine essence characterized both in both there was a certain principle of faith which was a feeling of reverence rather than the recognition of the unity and personality and providence of god the prayer of the buddhist was a yearning for deliverance from sorrow a hope of final rest but this was not to be attained until desires and passions were utterly suppressed in the soul which could be effected only by prayer devout meditations and a rigorous self-discipline in order to be purified and fitted for nirvana the soul it was supposed must pass through successive stages of existence in mortal forms without conscious recollection innumerable births and deaths with sorrow and disease and the final state of supreme blessedness the ending of the long and weary transmigration would be attained only with the extinction of all desires even the instinctive desire for existence buddha had no definite ideas of the deity and the worship of a personal god is nowhere to be found in his teachings which exposed him to the charge of atheism he even supposed that gods were subject to death and must return to other forms of life before they obtained final rest in nirvana nirvana means that state which admits of neither birth nor death where there is no sorrow or disease an impassive state of existence absorption in the spirit of the universe in the buddhist catechism nirvana is defined as the total cessation of changes a perfect rest the absence of desire illusion and sorrow the total obliteration of everything that goes to make up the physical man this theory of rebirths or transmigration of souls is very strange and unnatural to our less imaginative and subtle occidental minds but to the speculative orientals it is an attractive and reasonable belief they make the spirit the immortal part of man the soul being its emotional embodiment its spiritual body whose unsatisfied desires cause its birth and rebirth into the fleshly form of the physical body a very brief and temporary incarnation when by the progressive enlightenment of the spirit its longings and desires have been gradually conquered it no longer needs or has embodiment either of soul or of body so that to quote eliot coos in olcott's buddhist catechism a spirit in a state of conscious formlessness subject to no further modification by embodiment yet in full knowledge of its experiences during its various incarnations is nirvanic buddhism however viewed in any aspect must be regarded as a gloomy religion it is hard enough to crucify all natural desires and lead a life of self-abnegation but for the spirit in order to be purified to be obliged to enter into body after body each subject to disease misery and death and then after a long series of migrations to be virtually annihilated as the highest consummation of happiness gives one but a poor conception of the efforts of the proudest unaided intellect to arrive at a knowledge of god and immortal bliss it would thus seem that the true idea of god or even that of immortality is not an innate conception revealed by consciousness for why should good and intellectual men trained to study and reflection all their lives gain no clearer or more inspiring notions of the being of infinite love and power or of the happiness which he is able and willing to impart what a feeble conception of god is a being without the oversight of the worlds that he created without volition or purpose or benevolence or anything corresponding to our notion of personality what a poor conception of supernal bliss without love or action or thought or holy companionship only rest unthinking repose and absence from disease misery and death a state of endless impassiveness what is nirvana but an escape from death and deliverance from mortal desires where there are neither ideas nor the absence of ideas no changes or hopes or fears it is true but also no joy no aspiration no growth no life a state of non-entity where even consciousness is practically extinguished and individuality merged into an absolute stillness and a dreamless rest what a poor reward for ages of struggle and the final achievement of exalted virtue but if buddhism failed to arrive at what we believe to be a true knowledge of god and the destiny of the soul the forgiveness and remission or doing away of sin and a joyful and active immortality 
all which i take to be revelations rather than intuitions yet there were some great certitudes in its teachings which did appeal to consciousness certitudes recognized by the noblest teachers of all ages and nations these were such realities as truthfulness sincerity purity justice mercy benevolence unselfishness love the human mind arrives at ethical truths even when all speculation about god and immortality has failed the idea of god may be lost but not that of moral obligation the mutual social duties of mankind there is a sense of duty even among savages in the lowest civilization there is true admiration of virtue no sage that i ever read of enjoined mortality no ignorance can prevent the sense of shame of honor or of duty everybody detests a liar and despises a thief thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill these are laws written in the human consciousness as well as in the code of moses obedience and respect to parents are instincts as well as obligations hence the prince siddhartha as soon as he had found the wisdom of inward motive and the folly of outward right shook off the yoke of the priests and denounced caste and austerities and penances and sacrifices as of no avail in securing the welfare and peace of the soul or the favor of deity in all this he showed an enlightened mind governed by wisdom and truth and even a bold and original genius like abraham when he disowned the gods of his fathers having thus himself gained the security of the heights buddha longed to help others up and turned his attention to the moral instruction of the people of india he was emphatically a missionary of ethics an apostle of righteousness a reformer of abuses as well as a tender and compassionate man moved to tears in view of human sorrows and sufferings he gave up metaphysical speculations for practical philanthropy he wandered from city to city and village to village to relieve misery and teach duties rather than theological philosophies he did not know that god is love but he did know that peace and rest are the result of virtuous thoughts and acts let us then said he live happily not hating those who hate us free from greed among the greedy proclaim mercy freely to all men it is as large as the spaces of heaven whoever loves will feel the longing to save not himself alone but all others he compares himself to a father who rescues his children from a burning house to a physician who cures the blind he teaches the equality of the sexes as well as the injustice of castes he enjoins kindness to servants and emancipation of slaves as a mother as long as she lives watches over her child so among all beings said guatama let boundless good will prevail overcome evil with good the avaricious with generosity the false with truth never forget thy own duty for the sake of another's if a man speaks or acts with evil thoughts pain follows as the wheel the foot of him who draws the carriage he who lives seeking pleasure and uncontrolled the tempter will overcome the true sage dwells on earth as the bee gathers sweetness with his mouth and wings one may conquer a thousand men in battle but he who conquers himself alone is the greatest victor let no man think lightly of sin saying in his heart it cannot overtake me let a man make himself what he preaches to others he who holds back rising anger as one might a rolling chariot him indeed i call a driver others may hold the reins a man who foolishly does me wrong i will return to him the protection of my ungrudging love the more evil comes from him the more good shall go from me these are some of the sayings of the indian reformer which i quote from extracts of his writings as translated by sanskrit scholars some of these sayings rise to a height of moral beauty surpassed only by the precepts of the great teacher who many are too fond of likening to buddha himself the religion of buddha is founded on a correct and virtuous life as the only way to avoid sorrow and reach nirvana its essence theologically is quietism without firm belief in anything reached by metaphysic speculation yet morally and practically it inculcates ennobling active duties among the rules that buddha laid down for his disciples were to keep the body pure not to enter upon affairs of trade to have no lands and cattle or houses or money to abhor all hypocrisy and dissimulation to be kind to everything that lives never to take the life of any living being to control the passions to eat food only to satisfy hunger not to feel resentment from injuries to be patient and forgiving to avoid covetousness and never to tire of self-reflection his fundamental principles are purity of mind chastity of life truthfulness temperance 
abstention from the wanton destruction of animal life from vain pleasures from envy hatred and malice he does not enjoin sacrifices for he knows no god to whom they can be offered but he proclaimed the brotherhood of man if he did not reveal the fatherhood of god he insisted on the natural equality of all men thus giving to caste a mortal wound which offended the brahmins and finally led to the expulsion of his followers from india he protested against all absolute authority even that of the vedas nor did he claim any more than confucius originality of doctrines only the revival of forgotten or neglected truths he taught that nirvana was not attained by brahmanical rites but by individual virtues and that punishment is the inevitable result of evil deeds by the inexorable law of cause and effect buddhism is essentially rationalistic and ethical while brahmanism is a pantheistic tendency to polytheism and ritualistic even to the most offensive sacerdotalism the brahmin reminds me of a dunstan the buddhist of a benedict the former of the gloomy spiritual despotism of the middle ages the latter of self-denying monasticism in its best ages the brahmin is like thomas aquinas with his dogmas and metaphysics the buddhist is more like a medieval freethinker stigmatized as an atheist the brahmin was so absorbed with his theological speculation that he took no account of the sufferings of humanity the buddhist was so absorbed with the miseries of man that the greatest blessing seemed to be entire and endless rest the cessation of existence itself since existence brought desire desire sin and sin misery as a religion buddhism is an absurdity in fact it is no religion at all only a system of moral philosophy its weak points practically are the abuse of philanthropy its system of organized idleness and mendicancy the indifference to thrift and industry the multiplication of lazy fraternities and useless retreats reminding us of monastic institutions in the days of chaucer and luther the buddhist priest is a mendicant and a pauper clothed in rags begging his living from door to door in which he sees no disgrace and no impropriety Buddhism failed to ennoble the daily occupations of life and produced drones and idlers and religious vagabonds in its corruption it lent itself to idolatry for the Buddhist temples are filled with hideous images of all sorts of repulsive deities although Buddha himself did not hold to idol worship any more than to the belief in a personal God Buddhism says the author of its accepted catechism teaches goodness without a God existence without a soul immortality without life happiness without a heaven salvation without a savior redemption without a redeemer and worship without rites the failure of buddhism both as a philosophy and a religion is a confirmation of the great historical fact that in the ancient pagan world no efforts of reason enabled man unaided to arrive at a true that is a helpful and practically elevating knowledge of deity even buddha one of the most gifted and excellent of all the sages who have enlightened the world despaired of solving the great mysteries of existence and turned his attention to those practical duties of life which seemed to promise a way of escaping its miseries he appealed to human consciousness but lacking the inspiration and aid which come from a sense of personal divine influence buddhism has failed on the large scale to raise its votaries to higher planes of ethical accomplishment and hence the necessity of that new revelation which jesus declared amid the moral ruins of a crumbling world by which alone can the debasing superstitions of india and the godless materialism of china be replaced with a vital spirituality even as the elaborate mythology of greece and rome gave way before the fervent earnestness of christian apostles and martyrs it does not belong to my subject to present the condition of buddhism as it exists today in tibet in siam in china in japan in burma in ceylon and in various other eastern countries it spread by reason of its sympathy with the poor and miserable by virtue of its being a great system of philanthropy and morals which appealed to the consciousness of the lower classes though a proselytizing religion it was never a persecuting one and it is still distinguished in all its corruption for its toleration authorities the chief authorities that i would recommend for this chapter are max muller's history of ancient sanskrit literature Rev. S. Seals, Buddhism in China. Buddhism by T. W. Rhys Davids. Monier Williams, Zaktunala. I. Muir's Sanskrit Texts. 
Bernoff's essay sur la Veda, Sir William Jones's works, Colebrook's miscellaneous essays, Joseph Muller's religious aspects of Hindu philosophy, Manual of Buddhism by R. Spence Hardy, Dr. H. Clay Trumbull's The Blood Covenant, Orthodox Buddhist Catechism by H. S. Olcott, edited by Professor Elliot C. Coos. I have derived some instruction from Samuel Johnson's bulky and diffuse books, but more from James Freeman Clark's Ten Great Religions and Rawlinson's Religions of the Ancient World. End of section four.